Welcome to the International Broadcast Ministry of Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. Here at Touching Lives, our mission is to touch the lives of the lost and enrich the faith of the found. And now, here is pastor, author, and speaker, Dr. James Merritt. Now today, we're going to talk about a place that unknown, untold numbers of people have talked about they've dreamed about, they've hoped for, they've longed for, and that is heaven. And if I were to ask you the question today, do you believe you're going to heaven? I have no doubt the majority of you in this room and probably many of you watching online right now, you'd say, oh yeah, I, I know I'm going to heaven. And many of you would say that for the right reason. You'd say, oh yeah, I know I'm going to heaven because I've I've received the one, only one that can get me there, whose name is Jesus. And so you'd say, yeah, I know I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going for the right reason. And you may think you know a lot about heaven, but I'm gonna say something that's absolutely going to shock you. Heaven, as you think about it, the place where my mom is, my dad is, the place where many of your loved ones are right now, that heaven is not our final destination. I've heard untold numbers of people say in my ministry, you know what, when I die, I'm going to live forever in heaven. Well, that's half true. When you die, if you know Jesus, you are going to live forever, but not in heaven, not the heaven you think about. Because we're going to come back to earth with Jesus to a new heaven and a new earth. And that's where we're going to live Forever. Now, if you're a guest of ours this morning or you're new to us online, we've been in a series we've been calling From Here to Eternity. And what we've been talking about basically is, is the future, not the future on earth, but the future beyond earth. Not the future in this life, but the future after this life. Now, there's one thing we know absolutely for certain from the very beginning of time when God created the world, God intended for the human race, for his people to live in an absolutely perfect place. That's what God intended from the very beginning. And that intention has never changed. In fact, the story of history is going to end exactly the way the story of the Bible ends with God's people living in a new world with God where we're going to be with him forever. But the question always comes, but what, what's it going to be like? We know what this place is like. What is that place going to be like where we're going to live forever, where you really could call it heaven on earth. And if you want to know what it's going to be like, probably the greatest detail you'll find is found in one of the two easiest books in the Bible to find. And I want you to look for it right now. Obviously, the two easiest books in the Bible to find are what? Genesis and Revelation. All right, I want you to turn to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation chapter 21. And in that chapter, which by the way, I believe Revelation to me is the most fascinating book in the Bible. Now, if you're ever taught the book of Revelation in a Bible study class, or if a pastor ever preaches through Revelation, if that teacher or that preacher tells you they understand perfectly the book of Revelation, go find another class, go find another church, okay? I don't understand everything I read in the book of Revelation. I love the book, I don't understand it, but the good news is, there are parts of the book that's easy to understand. No question about it. And this is one of those parts. You may have heard somebody say something like this, and it's a good saying. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. Well, that sounds good, but it's not really true. Because if what we're about to read in Revelation chapter 21 is true, if what we read there is true, we do know what the future holds because somewhere around 95 AD on an island called Patmos, I've been there many times. If you ever get to go with me to Greece, we'll go to Patmos. It's a beautiful place. But on, around 95 AD on the island of Patmos, Jesus did John a favor and did us a favor. The resurrected Jesus pulled back the curtains of eternity and he tells a disciple named John, John, this is what our final home is going to look like. Our brand new, never to be destroyed, beautiful beyond words, home called heaven. So as we talk about heaven this morning, the point I want you to remember is this. The, this old world is not my final home, but the new world will be. This world we live in is not our final home, but the new world 
will be because three things God, John, Jesus told John are true. Number one, we're going to live in God's perfect place. That's the first thing Jesus says. John, you're going to live in God's perfect place. Now we're in Revelation chapter 21, verse one. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there was no longer any sea. Now, I happen to be one of those guys, and you've known this for 20 years. I believe this is the Word of God. And because it's the Word of God, I believe it is an absolutely perfect book, the only perfect book that's ever been written. Now, if I'm right, then you would expect a perfect ending to a perfect book, and guess what? You have it. Because the first two chapters of the Bible talk about the creation of heaven and earth, and now the last two chapters of the Bible talk about the recreation and the re restoration of a new heaven and a new earth. Now, to, in order to understand what Jesus told John, there are two words you have to understand in that passage. They're real key. One is the word new, and the other is the word earth. When you go to, the, when you read the Greek, uh, the Greek language, which is what the New Testament was written in, in the Greek language, there are actually two words for the word new. One word means new in time or new in origin. That's not the word that's used here. When Jesus said to John, there's gonna be a new heaven and a new earth, that word means new in nature or new in quality. In other words, we're not gonna be living in a, in, in, a, in a world brand new. We're gonna be living in a world that's renewed because here's what people don't understand. When God created the world in the beginning, there was nothing wrong with the world that God created. God, God didn't look at the first world he created, our world we live in now, and say, you know what, I can do better. As a matter of fact, when God created the very first world, he looked at everything he created. Do you remember what he said? He said, it's good. It's all good. If God says it's good, it's good. When God finished this world, he said, you know what, we are good to go. Well, when he renews this world and he's finished with the new world, he's gonna say it one more time. It's all good. What I want, want you to understand is, God's not going to take the world we live in right now and dump it into a garbage can and start over. He doesn't need to. He's going to renew this world. He's going to restore this world to the way it was meant to be, the way it was in the beginning, and that's where we're going to live forever and forever. So he says, we're gonna live in a new heaven and a new earth, a world that is renewed, a world that's restored. But then there's that word earth. And the Greek language has actually three words for the word earth. The first word means the world of politics and business and entertainment. You know, if you go to Hollywood, they'll say you're living in a, in a different world. That's the world, that's the word that the one word the Greek language uses. That's not the word he uses here. Another word means an era or a dispensation of time. Sometimes we'll say, you know, our grandkids are growing up in a different world than we grew up in. Well, we don't mean a literal different world. We mean a different time and a, and a, and a different culture. That's not the word used here. The word that's used here refers to the literal physical earth where we live right now. The dirt, the rocks, the mountains, the trees, the atmosphere, the geography, the geology. That's the word that John is using here. You say, well, why do we need that? Because we live in a polluted world. It's polluted physically. It's polluted morally. It's polluted spiritually. And God can't live in that kind of world because a perfect God will only live in a perfect world. Well, guess what? A perfect God with a perfect love wants his perfect people to live in a perfect world too. And so God says, you know what? I'm gonna give you a new heaven and a new earth. That means everything around us, the atmosphere, the planets, even our bodies, we've talked about this, is gonna be renewed. They're gonna be restored beyond, I mean, anything better than you could ever, ever, ever imagine. As a matter of fact, when I think about this, I don't know why, but this story always comes to my mind. I may have told it to you a long time ago, I don't remember, but. There was a very generous man in our church. And uh, years ago, he made it possible for me to go to Scotland to, to play golf. So we were playing it, if you're a golfer, we were playing it probably the most famous golf course in the world, St. Andrews, the old course. Everybody wants to play there because that's where golf was invented. And, and we were actually staying at St. Andrews Inn, which is right there on the golf course. We had 12 guys in our group. We we're all sitting in the lobby. And so this guy comes out. And he's assigning rooms to everybody. We all had a roommate. Well, everybody else got a room. And it was, their rooms were a little like, like, just like a Cracker Jack box, you know, two twin beds and a small bathroom, just a real small room. Well, they gave out keys to everybody, but me and my roommate, we didn't get a key. 
we were kind of wondering what was going on. And so I, we kind of noticed these guys scurrying around with it. This guy comes out dressed in a suit. You could tell he's kind of, he was the manager of the hotel. So he comes out. And by the way, everybody's lad. He just, everybody's called lad over there. He says, uh, lad, uh, I'm sorry. He said, we, we don't have your room. And I said, what happened? He said, we, we don't know, but somehow you, you, you didn't make the list and we don't have a room here. So I figured, okay, we're, I'm gonna go to a, you know, Motel 6 down the road. So I, I'm kind of getting my belongings up. And he says, uh, well, where are you going? I said, well, I'm, I'm getting ready to go to another hotel. He says, no, 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 you're staying here. I said, look, I, I thought you said you don't have a room. He said, well, we don't exactly have a room, but we do have a place for you to stay. Follow me. So we got our luggage, get in the elevator. We go up to the top floor of the hotel. He goes to this door and he opens this door and we walk into a 2,200 square foot suite and it was sweet. One hole, one room, one balcony overlooked the most famous hole in golf called the road hole down this fairway. And the other one looked down the 16th fairway where you could see about four holes of, of, of St. Andrews. It's over here. I looked at this guy and I said, we're staying here? Yes, lad, you're, you're, you're staying here. I said, what happened? He said, well, we made a mistake. It's not your mistake, we made a mistake. And I said, well, I don't guess we need to unpack. We're just going to stay here one night. He said, no, 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 lad, you're here. We're going to stay three nights. I said, no, no, you're staying here three nights. I couldn't help it. I said, I just, could I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, what does this room cost a night? He said, in American dollars? I said, yes, sir. He said, $3,200. I said, you're about to drop $10,000 on two country boys from America. He said, yes, lad. It was our mistake. Enjoy your stay. He walked out, and at that moment, one of the sweetest words in the English language to me was upgrade. <laughs> it was unbelievable. The, the, I mean, it, the views were spectacular. Now, I've been privileged to travel to many places around the world. I've seen some of those beautiful places to be found. Maybe you're like me. You've been on this, maybe this mountaintop view, maybe in the Rocky Mountains or somewhere like that. And you say, man, it doesn't get any better than this. Or, or, or maybe you've you know, been on a breathtaking beach. I got to play uh, Pebble Beach not long ago and I was on the seventh hole, that famous, thing, just looking out and I said, man, hard to get any better than this. Well, if what we're about to read is true, that's not true. We, we, we can't even imagine. We don't even know what it's like to live in an absolutely perfect place. But if you know Jesus, one day we're going to find out because John, Jesus said to John, hey, John, one day you're going to live in an absolutely perfect place, a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. Second thing John said, we're going to live in God's perfect presence. Not just in God's perfect place, but in God's perfect presence. Presence. Now, this is what's kind of interesting. This new heaven and this new earth is going to have a capital city. And by the way, it's the same city that's always been God's capital city. I don't know if you know this or not. We only have one capital city called Washington, D.C. God's only had one capital city from the beginning of time even now. Somebody tell me where that is. Jerusalem, right? That is God's capital city. So we read this in verse two. <clears throat> then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, where's it gonna be? Where the old one is. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. When you read the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, you'll find the place we're going to live forever is called a city over and over and over. The word keeps getting repeated. It is a city. And then God does something he only does with the Old Testament temple. He goes into great detail telling us about the architecture of this city and what it's going to look like. It is, I mean, all this detail, you know, we talk about the walls and the streets and the gates. And those aren't just a figure of speech. When, when, when you read about heaven, you realize, okay, we're talking about a literal place, a real place. We're talking about a literal location. This heaven is a real place. And the Bible says it's a city that literally comes straight down out of heaven. And listen, it has to be the greatest city ever. Because God's the architect. And God is the builder. And God's the interior decorator. I mean, this is God's city. By the way, it's exactly the promise Jesus made when he said to his disciples, John 14, 4, I'm going to prepare a place 
for you. Where's this place? It's in the new heaven. It's in the new earth. And what a city is going to be. Listen to what John says about this city. He said, first of all, it is a beautiful city. How do you know that? He says, because it's prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. By the way, ladies, that word beautifully dressed is a word that literally means cosmetic. It means to look beautiful. You've never seen a more beautiful city than this city. And that's why she's called a bride. I heard Adrian Rogers, my mentor, say one time, he said, you know, he said, I've married, I've done a lot of weddings. He said, I've never married a bride that wasn't beautiful. He then said, now I married a few that barely made it, but I've never married a bride that wasn't beautiful. Well, every bride's beautiful. And on their wedding day, everybody saw, I mean, everybody looks at the bride. And I believe God, I really believe this. I believe God is so excited. I believe God can hardly wait for the moment when he unveils his bride. It is a beautiful, beautiful city. But then he says something else. It is a big city. You don't have to worry about everybody being able to fit there because in verse 16, here's what we're told. Listen to this. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. So let me kind of put that in a way you can understand it. 1,200 stadia is about 1,400 miles. So this city is an exact square of 1,400 miles. They say, well, how big is that? Well, it's big enough to contain all the land from the Appalachians to the California coast, from Canada to Mexico. That city, just the city, is going to be 40 times the size of England, 10 times the size of France, larger than India. Wait a minute, that's just the ground floor. That's just the first floor. The city is as tall as it is wide. So if God were to stack the floors in this city like an architect, you know how, you know how tall this city would be? 600,000 stories tall. Say, man, that's awesome. Yeah, but what makes this city so fantastic is not how beautiful it is. What makes this city so fantastic is not how big it is. What makes this city so fantastic is who lives in it. Listen to what he says in verse three. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. This is where I'm gonna fail you. I'm gonna fail you miserably. Because I don't care how much of a golden tongue any preacher has, you can't really put that in a way where you really can grasp it. That we're gonna live in God's perfect presence. So think about it this way. For the first time, your eyes will see him. For the first time, your ears will hear him. For the first time, your hands can touch him. For the first time, your lips can kiss him. We will never leave his presence. He will never be out of sight. He will never be out of mind. Imagine having God as your next door neighbor. Because of the Holy Spirit of God, you may say, well, wait a minute. Now, we, we live in God's presence now. That's true. <clears throat> and he's always with us. That's true. But we don't completely live in his full, perfect presence because even though he is present, we can only see him by faith. We can only hear him by faith. But when we move to this city, we'll see him with our eyes, ear, hear him with our ears. He will be with us just the same way when he was with Adam and Eve. And the Bible talks about every day, he and Adam and Eve would just take a walk in the garden and just have talks in the garden and have fellowship in the garden. One day, it'll be just like that. We'll be in this city and we'll be able to do the very same thing. I remember, in, 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 Teresa and I were engaged for six months before we got married. And I wanna tell you, that six months was just miserable. We lived two hours apart. And, and I was working at a church and she was going to school and I could only see her on the weekends. Now, she was always in my heart. I was always in hers. 
But we were separated by time. We were separated by distance. We couldn't even talk. We didn't have cell phones back in those days, you can imagine. So a long distance call was, you know, too expensive. So every waking moment, every day of the week, I'm telling you, I would count the days and the hours and the minutes for the weekend when I could drive up there, pick her up, bring her back, and she would be in my presence for two full days. I, had, I went out of town this past week. I was gone for three days, and I told her on the way to the airport. I called her. I said, man, I'm miserable. I said, I just don't, I don't like to leave you. Even to this day, I don't like to be out of her presence. I'd rather be with her than to be with anybody else in the world. Well, one day, we're going to live in God's perfect presence. You won't need faith. You'll have sight. I've never heard God speak out loud, but one day I will. I've never seen him physically, but one day I will. I've never touched him physically. One way, one day I will. I can't wait to just kneel and kiss the feet of Jesus. We will be in God's perfect presence. We'll be in God's perfect place. But the second favorite thing to me about heaven is this. We're going to live in God's perfect peace. I want you to think about this. If you'll just listen every day, just be real quiet, listen every day, you're gonna hear in every city around the world, you're gonna hear something. It may be the cries of a mother who's lost a child to a mass shooting, to a disease to a drunk driver, to a drug overdose. There's something you'll see almost every day somewhere. You'll see people weeping at a funeral procession or a graveside. You'll watch an incredible sadness as their loved ones are put under the earth for the final time. Or you go to a hospital, you'll hear people moaning and groaning in a hospital bed because of the pain and the suffering that they're in because they've got this interminable, insufferable disease. They want death to come. Say, so, yeah, I've been there, done that. I see that, I hear that. Well, not in heaven. You won't hear or see any of that in heaven. He said in verse four, he, I love this picture, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Now, let's just, let's just plant ourselves there just for a minute. No sorrow in heaven. The one part of my job that I hate, I despise. I'm just being honest, and you wouldn't like it either. I'm in the sorrow business. I can't get away from it. <clears throat> I deal with it every, almost every day, but at least every week of my life, every week, I hear somebody else has cancer. Somebody else lost a loved one. Somebody else has died. Somebody else has had a tragedy. Somebody else has been in an accident. How many homes have I walked into of parents who, told their son, who had to tell me their son was killed in an automobile accident? I remember one of the first funerals I've ever did at the past church I used to pastor. I'd been there two weeks. I did the funeral of a baby who died of crib death. I'd never experienced that before. And I did the funeral of a mom and a dad. It was the first child they ever had. He died of crib death. My uh, second church I ever pastored, my little second country church, two deacons lost a son and a daughter in two weeks. I never had to deal with that. And I saw firsthand the, the, the unbelievable sorrow. I've walked, I've walked through life with people uh, who, who you know, had to sit by and watch a loved one wrestle in agony with the process of dying. And I want to tell you, there is nothing more gut-wrenching than hearing the wails and cries of people whose lives have been decimated, whose hearts have been devastated by grief and sorrow. And I'll be honest with you, I get weary of it. I get tired of it. There are times, maybe it's because I'm getting older, but you know, you wonder, is the next text, is the next phone call, is the next email, is the next knock on the door gonna be about this or going to be about that? And then I come to this passage and I read, wait a minute, in heaven on earth, there will be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more sighing, no crying, no mourning, no pain, no sadness, just gladness. Hey, let me give you some great news and don't take this personally if you're one of these people. But there won't be any need for doctors or dentists in heaven. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no, no, no more pain. No more hospitals, no more hospice, no more health care. Thomas More, Ireland's most revered poet, put it this way. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven 
cannot heal. There'll be no death in heaven. Can you imagine a place, just imagine one place where there are no cemeteries, no graves, no crematoriums, no funerals, no funeral homes, no mausoleums, no gravestones. I have to tell you this, this just came to my mind. I'm gonna tell it, I probably shouldn't, but I'll tell it anyway. It's one of the funniest, weirdest things I've ever had happen. There was a man that lost his mom and asked me to do his mom's funeral. I'd never met his mother, but he asked me to do the funeral for his mom. And uh, about 20 of our folks showed up, and, and so I did the funeral for his mother. And I noticed that I, when I, the, 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 uh, there was really no casket, really, but the, I was preaching, and there was a window behind me with the curtains closed. So we get through the funeral, and I started to step down. He said, uh, hey, pastor, I need you to come with me. I said, sure, okay. So we walk into this door behind where I was preaching, and there's this place with these things you pull out like this. And I said, what is that? He said, well, he said, this is the crematorium. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, yeah. He said, my mom's in that one right there. I said, oh, okay. I'm not making this up. And so he walks over there, and first thing he does, he pledges allegiance to the flag. I don't know what that was about, but he pledged allegiance to the flag. And then he looked at me and he said, uh, would you do the honors? I said, what do you mean when I do the honors? He said, see that button right there? He said, yeah. He said, that's the button that's going to burn my mother up. Would you do the honors? I said, let me get this straight. That's your mom. You're going to burn her up. You want me to push the button? He said, well, yeah, you're the man of God. I said, I know the man of God, but I don't want to push the button. I said, man, I'm, we're not grilling hamburgers here, man. I mean, you're about to put, cook your mama here. No, 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 I, I want you to do it. He said, I'm going to stand at attention. You do it, right? So, I mean, I'm... I'm Fire the thing up, push the button, right? And so I said, how long does this take? He says, about two hours. I said, well, I'm, I think I need to leave. I've got another appointment I need to get to. Now, here's my point. We, we laugh about it, but I walked out. It was sad. It was just really, 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 really sad. And I thought, man, no more crematories, no more gravestones. No need for policemen or the military or a neighborhood watch. Don't have to worry about mass shootings or murders or robberies or terrorist attacks. Don't need gun control because there'll be no more death. And the reason why there'll be no more sorrow and no more death is real simple. There will be no more sin. He says in verse 27, nothing impure will ever enter it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. See, right now we're living in a world where everybody's not just good. I mean, when we get to heaven, we're gonna live in a world where everybody's not just good, they're gonna be perfect. So now think about this world. There'll be no arguments. There'll be no debates. There'll be no conflicts. There'll be no lawsuits. There'll be no confrontation. There'll be no fighting. It's a world where no one ever needs to be forgiven and no, no one ever needs to forgive because there'll be nothing to forgive and there'll be nothing of which to be forgiven. It's going to be a place of perfect peace, perfect harmony. I was reading about a missionary and he was talking to a young Christian one time about the second coming of Jesus. And this young Christian asked the missionary, he said, you know, ask him a strange question. He said, let me ask you a question. He said, I, I don't know much about the second coming of Jesus, but, and, and this may be a bad question, but he said, you know, when Jesus comes back, he said, what do you think he'll say? I mean, when, when he comes back, what do, you be, what do you think will be the first words out of his mouth? Well, well, this missionary was, he hadn't thought about that before, and I had never thought about it before. He's taken aback. So I, I, you know, I, I was trying to think for an answer. Then he remembered what Paul wrote about Jesus coming back to a letter he wrote to a church in Thessalonica. And he turned to that passage and he said, well, here's what the Bible says. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. And then that man said, yeah, but what do you think he's gonna shout? Man, I thought this missionary gave a great answer. He thought for a moment, he said, I'll tell you what he's going to shout. He's going to shout, enough. And the guy said, enough? He said, yes. He's going to come back. He's going to say, enough suffering, enough death, enough sorrow, enough terror, enough sickness, enough suffering enough. And I love the way the book of Revelation changes our thinking about heaven. 
Because when you think about heaven and you read the book of Revelation, you say, wait a minute. Y'all, I may be going up there if I die, but one day I'm coming back down here. John changes our whole thing. He says, look, don't think about where you're going to live forever being up there. It's going to be down here. Oh, yeah. When we die, if Jesus tarries, we're going up to heaven. But one day Jesus is going to come back and we're all going to come back with him down here. So if you die, you're going to go up to heaven and watch what God is doing. But one day we're going to come down here and watch what God is going to do. He's going to bring us to a perfect place where we will live in his perfect presence and we will live in perfect peace. And oh yes, we will live happily ever after, forever and forever. Not with us, not us with God in heaven, but with God with us down on earth, it will be heaven on earth. So I'm working on this message six, seven weeks ago. I said, Lord, I can't do this justice. When you even tell me that no eye has seen and no ear has heard, no mind can conceive what you prepared for us, I can't really do it justice. And then I came across this quote by C.S. Lewis, who was giving a radio talk one time, and I said, you know what? I think he said it about as well as I could say it. I want you to listen to what he said. He said, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there's such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there's such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire. Well, there's such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. So I want you young people over here to listen to your pastor today. You weren't made for this world. Neither was I. None of us were made for this world. We were made for a perfect world where we would live in God's perfect presence and live with God's perfect peace. This right now, the world we live in is polluted, it's stained, it is sin-wracked, it is filled with evil and meanness. It's a place where the lamb cannot lie down with the wolf. It's a place where babies can't play with snakes. And it's, it's a place where even the best of us has the worst of us within us. But there's coming a place and there's coming a time there's coming an experience, there's coming an event where God is gonna create a new heaven and a new earth and we'll be for the first time in a perfect place in his perfect presence and with a perfect, perfect peace. We were made not for this world, we were made for another world. We were made for heaven on earth. Don't miss it. Would you pray with me? You know, when you preach a message on heaven, the one question that a pastor has to ask is this one. It has to be. Do you know if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven? Do you know if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven? If you say, well, yeah, I do, but why? Why? If you give any other reason than your faith in Jesus, you're not going. Or, if you say, well, I feel like I would, think I would, I hope I would, that's not good enough. Do you know for sure that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven? That's a big question. It's a huge question. I talked to two men this week. I witnessed to two different men this week. Two men who both will swear to you they're going to heaven, but based on what they told me, they're not. Do you know for sure if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven? If either you'd say, I don't, or I'm not sure, I want to make sure, then why don't you just pray this prayer right now? Why don't you just say, Lord Jesus, I believe the only way to heaven is you. I believe you died for my sins. I believe God raised you from the dead, and I believe you're alive right now. 
And I believe that you paid for my sin so I could go to heaven. So Lord, today, I confess to you, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I believe you are that savior. And I ask you to come into my heart and save me today. I surrender my life to you as my Lord, and I do trust you as my Savior. And now give me the power to live for you the rest of my life. The 2023 Mountaintop Conference is headed back to the beautiful Mansion Theater in Branson, Missouri, October 2nd through 4th. Don't miss this exciting event packed with impactful preaching from Dr. James Merritt and the powerful vocals of Charles Billingsley the Booth Brothers, and Jim and Melissa Brady. In addition to Dr. Merritt, two of his friends join him, Pastor Ted Cunningham from Woodland Hills Family Church in Branson, and decorated Black Hawk Down Army veteran Dr. Jeff Struker will bring inspiring messages. You will leave relaxed, refreshed, and renewed after spending time in the beautiful Ozark Mountains with old and new friends. Visit mountaintopconference.com for all the details and make plans to join Dr. James Merritt at the 2023 Mountaintop Conference. This fall, Dr. James Merritt is inviting you to join the first ever Touching Lives Bible Study by joining other viewers in exploring one of the most important books of the New Testament, the book of 1 Corinthians. For a gift of any size, you'll receive a copy of Dr. Merritt's new commentary, Exalting Jesus and 1 Corinthians. It's an in-depth study of Paul's letter to the Corinthian church written with everyday believers in mind. And as a bonus, we have prepared a free 16-week study and discussion guide to accompany the book. You can get both by going to touchinglives.org slash fall study right now. Don't miss this impactful 16 week Bible study. Get your free study materials today and let God's word in 1 Corinthians transform your life. If you have ever wanted to see the wonders of Africa or explore the land where Jesus walked, we have great news for you. Dr. James Merritt has two exciting trips planned for spring 2024, and he invites you to join him for one or both exciting journeys. The first trip is an inspiring tour of Kenya, where you will connect with believers in Africa to worship God and serve the less fortunate. Then you will fly to the magical Maasai Mara National Park to see the beautiful wonders of God's creation as you go on safari. The second trip is a tour of the Holy Land, where you will walk in the footsteps of Jesus Imagine seeing where Jesus lived, taught, and worked miracles. See the Holy Scriptures come to life as you visit Bethlehem, Jericho, the Mount of Olives, the Sea of Galilee, and Jerusalem. This is truly the trip of a lifetime. To learn more about these special tours, visit touchinglives.org today. Space is limited, so reserve your spot today. touching the lives of the lost and enriching the faith of the found. This is Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. This broadcast is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts. 